The term white knight describes a range of frankly odd behaviors that is typically perceived as not being a good thing. Much like the knights in fairy tales who come riding to the rescue of some very flawed, damaged, or distressed person or noun, whatever their chosen thing to champion happens to be, they will fight for their honor with blessed gleaming armor, stout shield, and a sword that sings, and defend all facets that need defending, even the indefensible, or die trying. Their morals are above reproach and only those that have something to fear or hide can ever speak out against them. Any attacks on the noun of their affection are to be dismissed. For how can a simple, common peasant possibly understand something so complex as honor and the elevated intellect required for the great sacrifice which they make? Now, pluck that character out of the storybook and drop them squarely into the midst of gaming. I mean, all of gaming. This video is not intended to attack these characters, but to actually understand the behavior, which I found to be surprisingly complex after a bit of research. Who is and isn't a knight can be subjective, so don't take offense if you happen to simply support the game and defend it from a lot of the stale and ill-informed opinions that get spat out of PC gaming and their followers. Tons of people support the game. I play it myself and support it because it's fun. But like all things, there are some serious criticisms to be had. White knights exist in most facets of society. Anywhere there is something under attack, which is and everywhere they are to be found. Let's look a bit at why this happens. I'm going to be picking on Star Citizen for the most part since it is the most recent game I have played where it exists and is kind of unfortunately well known for this kind of behavior. But I'll draw on some examples from elsewhere as well. I'm also going to be painting in some broad strokes since I don't have time to referee every internet fight about Star Citizen, so I'll acknowledge that there are some exceptions to what I'm saying. For those that don't know, Star Citizen is a somewhat controversial sci-fi game that has its roots of development reaching as far back as 2010 when it went into pre-production. To understand White Knights, you have to understand Star Citizen's non-traditional and endless development cycle. It had its official reveal in 2012, the same year it launched a Kickstarter which was wildly successful. Kickstarter games, particularly Kickstarter MMOs, have a horrible reputation for overselling, under-delivering, and never finishing. Games like Chronicles of Illyria, or should I say the idea for the game of Chronicles of Illyria never came to fruition and turned into a public spectacle where the developer was essentially accused of scamming, defrauding, and other bad words. It, it was bad. There are a ton of other examples to choose from, but suffice to say, Kickstarters are very touchy subjects in gaming. It's an interesting mix of developers who just want to make games without having to submit to the pressures and constraints of having a publisher, developers who have no clue how to actually make what they are selling, and developers who aren't developers. Star Citizen seemed to buck that trend, blasting past their initial Kickstarter goal and eventually reaching the stretch goal of 5.5 million. But as it turns out, that 5.5 million is about 1% of the total funding raised by the developer Cloud Imperium Games, or SIG and their maverick leader, the guy who is responsible for creating it all, Chris Roberts. More on that in a minute. Now, a decade after its reveal, there is a playable alpha, which in all honesty is a lot of fun. I got in on it by picking up one of the cheapest ships, the Aurora, for $45. A bit expensive for an early access game, but I've paid more for some really dicked and unfun games. Selling ships or ship packages is another way SIG makes its money. And this is where we start to see the unity of the Star Citizen players start to fracture. To way oversimplify it, SIG has put a number of concept ships up for pledge, or a churched up way of saying that ship doesn't exist yet, but they are working on it. Some of the ships turned out to be pretty cool, some turned out to be awful, but the trouble here is that when you're selling concept ships that don't exist yet to the internet, you can't calmly or quietly state that they can't be flown until they actually exist. You have to smash people over the head with it, or else. This happens. SIG got a warning from the UK's Advertising Standards Agency, 
it has no teeth. It doesn't harm Sig materially in any way, but it says, hey, make it clear that you can't fly concept ships in game yet until after they exist. If you're sensing my sarcasm, it's because you can find this whopper of a rebuke smack dab in the middle of the salt bog of r slash star citizen refunds. A subreddit awash with people clamoring for Sig's blood and Chris Roberts' head for any number of past slights both real and... Well, I'll leave it at that. The responses here made everyone look bad. People who cheer for any small inconvenience that happens to the Star Citizen team. Like, if you reported that Chris Roberts got a flat tire on the way to work, there would be much celebration and embracing and solidarity with a little bit of moisture. It was a very Karen-y moment for the anti-Star Citizen movement. Sig and Chris Roberts, on the other hand, have not done anything to help themselves here. They do push the limits of integrity and honesty in fundraising, then turn around and pat themselves on the back for being so independent of big mean publishers. While people with legitimate grievances get trampled underneath a very carefully planned advertising campaign, making them feel like they aren't being heard. So that is a glimpse of the rabid Dark Knight community. See r slash Star Citizen refunds for more complaining around Star Citizen. I don't want to make light of it too much because as we are about to see, there are many, many problems with the game and how it is being developed. I spoke a bit about Chris Roberts, but who is he and why is there such a cult of personality built up around him. If you don't know, a cult of personality is what it sounds like, where a group of people become devoted to someone's persona or ideology, etc. Charles Manson is always the go-to example, but there are a lot less murdery examples like Bill Murray, Ellen DeGeneres, Donald Trump, Barack Obama all have a core of people who bask in their existence. Being their biggest fans and most ardent defenders, even with the most glaring of evidence about some wrongdoing. They will explain away, downplay, or outright dismiss legitimate criticism as conspiracy, Lies, you get the picture, you know the type. But how did Chris Roberts, a guy almost no one has ever heard of, get the same kind of status as all those famous people? I've never been accused of having a small vision. Well, vision, I guess. What Chris has planned for Star Citizen is admittedly nerd porn. It is a grand idea of a universe even its biggest critics could get lost in. An MMO that is so immersive and realistic where you can truly be free to be any character you want to be, where each decision counts and has a butterfly effect. A working player-built economy, in other words, a modern successor to EVE Online, but with more stuff. Star Citizen is to be the magnum opus to Chris's game developing career, and if you look at games he has developed with 2020 eyes, they kinda seem like he was practicing to make Star Citizen. He was a programmer and producer for the Wing Commander and Strike Commander games in the 1990s. While they obviously didn't age well, at the time they were pretty well received, and there is still a community for those games today which is a really impressive achievement. He also created the game Freelancer in 2003, which was a sequel to an earlier game, Star Lancer, which came out in 2000. Freelancer is a space flight simulator with trading, combat, it had more than two hours worth of in-game cutscenes, and was also generally well received. The problem with the game was that it made some big promises before launch that didn't materialize in its final release like the dynamic world where the universe changes due to events not influenced by the player. The boiled down version was because Microsoft. So it went something like this. Freelancer had a lot of hype around it. It was announced in 1997 and was to have a two and a half year development cycle and was supposed to be on shelves by 2000. At the 2000 E3, Chris said that it would be ready by 2001. Starting to see an early pattern develop here. That same year, Chris's company Digital Anvil started talks with Microsoft. Chris said that he needed time, and he needed money to make the game happen. I need time. Okay. I also need money. Okay. I also don't want my vision for the game to have any constraints. Okay. Really? Sure. Microsoft bought the company and promptly constrained his vision for the game for the usual reasons, time and money. 
But it was out of Curse's hands now, and by 2003, Microsoft had had enough. Drop it. No. I said, drop it. No. Let go of the game. Let go of the game, Chris. Stop resisting. No! The game was finally released, and Chris was left a bitter man. The experience leaving him distrustful of big corporations and publishers in general, which is a huge part of his commitment to crowdfunding. He came out of the whole freelancer situation looking like the hero who had been wronged by big tech and is leading the charge against evil publishers and the soulless company who demands that a game releases on time or at any time ever. In the process, however, he did build a reputation as someone who is difficult to work with, micromanages to the extreme, and changes goals on a whim. Sounds about right. So we can safely fast forward to the Kickstarter I mentioned earlier. With some good games under his belt and a carefully crafted image of the rebel game designer now brought to bear, the Kickstarter he launched sent some shockwaves through gaming and made a statement that the traditional method of creating games were going to be a thing of the past. What a rebel. There are a lot more details and nuances here, but that is the gist. Look, I've gone way down into the weeds here, and we're supposed to be understanding White Knights, but it is important to understand why it became easy for certain personality types to become Holy Crusaders for Team Roberts. It didn't spring out of nowhere. So by my unqualified analysis, there are three things that make the Cult of Curse Roberts possible. One, a past experience of pushing the limits in game design. Two, a heroic rebel image. And three, a seriously vast vision for the game. Whether any of that is true or not is up for debate. The deal with Star Citizen is that it promises to be an MMO, among other things. And that appeals to a very broad crowd. Everyone from people who are bored with sandbox, choose your own adventure games, to the guys who have written six volumes of their own lore in the time it's taken me to speak this sentence. Hard core role players. The player that just needs a universe, a premise, and a stack of G fuel, and they can take it from there. Whatever you feel about that kind of player, they tend to be the core audience that a developer will end up listening to more overall, because that type of player is the most committed to whatever realm is being peddled, tends to be the most vocal, and has a regular presence. Now we combine that with the horrible clusterfuck of a business model that is crowdfunding. I don't believe for a second that Chris knew what he was getting into when he launched that Kickstarter. And it is with the benefit of 2020 hindsight that I can say that if I showed up in his polished Italian leather shoes tomorrow, I would hurl myself off the tallest building I could find and shoot myself in the dick on the way down just to have something besides the balancing act of crowdfunding to think about in those final seconds so I could smile for the first time in 10 years. I wanted to make a diagram illustrating how running SIG has to be balanced when it comes to managing the things that influence public opinion. But it turns out the thing would have like six axes and I don't speak NASA, so this is what you get. The goal, as with any crowdfunding, is to attract whales while still offering buy-ins for the rest of us broke asses. And in that, you can't offer undue preference to the whales over everyone else. Or at least not look like you are doing that. But on the other hand, Sig needs money. Whales have money. There are two things you can offer to sink your hooks into a whale. Exclusivity and influence. SIG offers both of those things in the form of the concierge service. People who spend $1,000 are inducted into the concierge service, which offers, I guess, an enhanced experience and a kind of public recognition from SIG in the form of a top hat and monocle like the Monopoly guy, an exclusive ship, and a number of other things including access to Squadron 42, which I am intentionally avoiding talking about. From there, there are a few more tiers, each with their own perks that go all the way up to the $25,000 Legatus Navium level, much like every YouTuber's Patreon. By the way, I have a Patreon. When you have a development cycle as long as Star Citizen and members of the community willing to spend that kind of dough to keep SIG working on facial animations, rest assured many of those members are going to become entrenched and titled defenders of a game they are willing to sacrifice that much of their income for. 
So, let me start to tie all this together. First of all, there is no formula for this, and it is all my opinion, which is based on my observations in-game, in my Discord, and a few subreddits. So, make of this what you will. The hardest part of this video has been this one. How to sum up the traits and qualities of the White Knight. The White Knight is perceived as one who is able to dismiss even the most objectively valid criticisms of their chosen game. That old saying of he who defends everything defends nothing holds a huge glaring significance here. The second you can't admit a company fucked up somewhere, a company you don't own, work for, or have any influence or stake in, you lost. Two, they are gatekeepers. If they deem you unworthy of joining their game and their community, then God help you. You aren't going to enjoy Star Citizen. Three, they have an inflated sense of self in relation to their influence on game development or understanding of the overall grand vision. Which is a nice way of saying delusions of fucking grandeur. There is safety in the belief that you are a big part of the game that you have spent a lot of time and maybe a lot of money in as well. But get it right, unless your name is Chris Roberts, your influence is almost zero. Some view their donations to the project as an investment, but it is not. It is what I said, a donation. You have to accept that the only thing guaranteed to get in return is whatever is clearly outlined in whatever package you purchase. So I've just described every asshole on the internet, right? Well, with Star Citizen, there is an extra tinge of urgency in the tone of the White Knight. Star Citizen is not a for sure thing. It is in mortal danger, and they know it. As a crowdfunded project, it lives and dies on public sentiment, unless it gets enough private donations to keep it afloat. And with this long development cycle, the two sides have had such a long time to attack each other and belittle and insult that... It doesn't really matter what the truth is. There are a lot of people who want to see Star Citizen fail for the simple fact that it would upset the White Knights. And in turn, some of the White Knights and some of the Whales pour ever more funds into the project in order to see that not happen. So from Sig's perspective, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but they have to know that at the end of the day, White Knights are going to be bad for the business. If you hate yourself enough to delve into the arguments back and forth, head over to either the Star Citizen Reddit or the Star Citizen Refunds Reddit and feast your eyes upon some of the arguments there that will eventually make you want to start punching yourself in the face. It's hard to say who is more out of touch with reality, but the White Knights certainly have a competitive edge. Like, it's impossible to have an argument with somebody who is so incredibly detached from reality that half the time they're not even having the same argument as you. It really reminds me of this interrogation I did in Iraq. We rolled up on this dude and some of his friends who looked like a bunch of homeless guys who were going ham with AKs on this Iraqi army position and I don't even know if the Iraqi army guys were in there or not. It doesn't really matter but they either cowered or left or whatever they do. So they saw us coming and dropped their guns. We took them without a fight. I picked the craziest looking dude because I figured it would make a good story one day and he drew short straw because I happen to be an actual interrogator. Some gunfight, huh? Ha! What's funny? We shot at them, not you. Why were you shooting? No, not me, them. You were definitely shooting. I saw you, so did everyone else. There's video. And you asked the guard when you can have your gun back. No. No what? I don't have bullets. Well, not now you don't, we took them. No. Know what? You're CIA. This is a plot. Okay. What's the plot? No. Know what? I shot at them, not you. So you did shoot? No. 
point I'm trying to make here is that the Star Citizen conversation is a devolving one the longer it goes on. And it is on SIG to provide a little bit of direction here. They have turned their biggest supporters into a Gestapo who have shut down any form of dissent, thereby creating one of the worst deco chambers you have ever seen in gaming. The long-term survival of Star Citizen truly depends not only on the public's perception of the project itself, but of the player base, the people that if you pick up the game, you are going to encounter. And if this is your most vocal demographic, then people aren't going to come out and play. SIG needs to eventually make the hard decision to start to police the people that are going around policing everyone else with a fake badge. Or don't. I frankly don't care anymore after researching everything for this video. So on that cheery note, I'm going to leave it here. I have been Mike Tannick. Thank you all so much for watching. I will see you next time.